respiratory asthma. Oh my goodness, asthma. This is one chapter that I want to remind you that I know typically, you remember how I mentioned they may do some A&P questions, general physiology or uh, anatomy physiology questions? They're very commonly will ask about four questions on assessment of respiratory status. They will ask things like, where are bronchofascicular sounds? In what conditions would you find hyperresonance? Hyperresonance is always found in like tr air trapping, like in asthma and so forth. You remember in your um, anatomy book when you had those pictures where you had the um, the I inspiratory and the expiratory line, and if you see a long E, e or expiratory, that means that they're air trapping. The, anybody that has a long expiratory phase usually has hyperresonance and air traps. Asthma kids. Um, what is egophony? Do y'all remember egophony? Do you remember that one? Okay, there's that word up there, E, E, E. Now, let's think about that. You see, it's all coming back, right? Egophony, if you have just air, by asking them to say E, the E will change to another sound like A. But if you have consolidation like fluid with pneumonia, your E will remain an E because it has something to transmit the sound. Does that make sense? Um, pulmonary function tests, I just want to note up here with you is, is if greater than eight years of age, you know, it's hard to get PFTs on kids unless they cooperate, right? So you have to be able to have a cooperative child. This is an important concept. I want you to think about this. What is obstructive versus restrictive pulmonary disease? Well, obstructive means the airflow rates are reduced, lung volumes within normal range are larger. And typically a child should, uh, who is having trouble exhaling, in other words, they trap air, means that their rates are going to be decreased. And guess what else is going to be decreased? Their FEV1. What is FEV1? Do you all remember what that is? That first second of that expiratory phase. They want to capture how strong that is, you know. And so we want to think about, does everybody remember what the normal is for FEV1? It's actually 80%, at least 80, no, 100% perfect, right, but at least 80 because when we look at stepwise management for asthma, you're going to see that which is less than that. We also know that for obstructive, lesion, uh, obstructive disease, excuse me, um, asthma, chronic bronchiolitis, and cystic fibrosis would be some good examples. Now, what about a restrictive disease? Restrictive means that the reduced volume of air and expiratory flow rates. This is a child that is typically having trouble inhaling, thus affecting the volume. So people that have pneumonia, a child that has pneumonia, they breathe shallow, right? Very shallow. It's like, <gasps> they can't breathe enough air in. They're restricted. So we're going to start off with the first condition is bronchiolitis. Now, I always think about, I always say, well, what is bronchiolitis? Bronchiolitis is bronchitis in little people. Isn't that a nice way to think of it? Kids under the age of three is what we call bronchiolitis. And this one here is lower respiratory tract, typically among children less than three years of age. Often it's considered viral, of which good old RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, is the most common. 50% of the cases. The other cases would be like adenoviruses and so forth, but that's real common. Your signs and symptoms, upper respiratory lasting for days, fever, gradual respiratory distress such as nasal flaring, grunting, strider, cyanosis. And because they're, um, they may get some hyperinflation, it may, their liver may be more palpable or spleen more palpable. So just want you to know that if you're examining them. We also think about chest x-ray will show hyperinflation. Um, nasal washings, they can actually pick up the RSV virus. And we want to think about what is your role in managing them? Well, infants with mild distress can be treated pretty much outpatient supportive care, keeping them well hydrated and so forth. Um, you want to think about any child that is going to be what? Starting to show some respiratory distress, you probably need to head them into the hospital. They may need a, a, a racemic epinephrine treatment. Um, but prevention of RSV for high-risk infants with the use of Synergis. Synergis is very expensive. And the pediatric folks probably know this very closely. There's very stringent criteria for who should get this. And Synergis is given I am every month during the criteria, I'm sorry, during the um, 
the time frame that RSV is most prevalent. And um, what I want to have you do is to look at your notes. When you think about with respiratory, let me just pull that right up here for us. The respiratory criteria is actually more involved than what's here. It, you'll notice there it says less than, if you have a child that is less than two years of age with chronic lung treat, disease that's treated within six months of the RSV season, or if you have a preemie, less than 32 weeks gestation during the first year of life, or if you have an infant that's between, say, 32 and 35 weeks, but they also have other risk factors. They attend daycare. They have school-age siblings. What's that? Why is that a risk factor? Because they're bringing germs home and abnormal airways and any type of a neuromuscular condition. Those are kids that would be good candidates. And actually, the criteria is much more deeply involved, but this is about the extent of what you need to know. Okay? And a lot of that makes sense. So let's move to asthma. Asthma, they love, asthma just like when we do anemia, I'd say six to eight questions in that arena. So asthma, as we know, is a disease of increased responsiveness, trachea bronchus, widespread narrowing. And as you look at the pathophysiology, you know, from the smooth muscle to edema, hyperemia, uh, the mucus, inflammation, but look at five, number five, very important, thickening of the epithelial basement membrane. When you get to that level, guess what? You're at severe level. And once you get to that level and that membrane becomes remodeled, you are not going back to an earlier stage. So the whole idea behind managing asthma is to keep you at the lowest stage because you don't want remodeling to occur. Kids that get remodeling are probably going to need oral steroids. And they're going to be much more at risk for many exacerbations, hospitalizations, and so forth, and even death. We know it's a serious matter. These are some of your causes, dust mites, pets, cockroaches, indoor molds, exercise, irritants, um, I mean, stress, cold air. There's a lot of different ones. I mean, we could go on for a long, long list. Your signs and symptoms, pretty much, as you look at this, they can become diaphoretic, difficult to do what? Work, walk, and, and talk at the same time. Um, and this is, you know, kids usually don't have that problem. It's the older people like me that, you know, when you're trying to walk and talk and do things like that. Cough and a chest tightness. Ominous signs, obviously, absent breath sounds, and you think about what's pulses paradoxus, it gives you a nice little definition there. More than a 10 millimeter of blood pressure change systolically and amplitude between inspiration and expiration, so you're going to see that change. That means their body is stressed. They're not able to lie down or maintain uh, recumbency and, of course, cyanosis. So some of the labs you want to think about, looking at their WBCs, they're going to, this is a what? This is an allergic triad uh, condition. So you're going to see eosinophilia. Your PFTs will be typical of obstructive uh, dysfunction. Hospitalization definitely be recommended. Say if you did peak flows and they're less than 60 liters per minute initially, and you give them a treatment, an aerosolized treatment, and there's no improvement, absolutely hospitalized. And chest x-rays usually are not routinely done unless you're concerned about another condition. So it's usually not real typical. We also think about, now I still really like this chart. And the reason I say this is, you know they've, reformed, they've redone the chart. In 2007, and again, I can't believe it's been that long. It seems like the time just flies. But... What happened is this is the old chart that we're all very familiar with. And you'll see classification severity. Does everybody realize you only have two types of asthma, even though we have four steps? You got intermittent and you have persistent. Persistent has three levels. Did you ever think of it like that? And when you kind of chunk it down like that, it makes sense. You want to stay at the lowest level in either one of those. But intermittent, here it means that when you look at symptoms, and then nighttime awakenings, how often they use a rescue inhaler, what kind of interference do they have with daily activity and lung function? Now, there's your FEV1. See, 80, uh, greater than 80, to as you go across down to even below 60. And that shows that the child is worsening as they go across. You're looking at the number of times they have a nighttime awakenings. Does anybody realize how many treatments, or how many doses, excuse me, 
are in an inhaler, like a Ventolin HFA inhaler? It's 200. So if you have, um, now this doesn't count it right, right here where it says two days a week you're using it daily, seven time, several times a day. I've had kids that come in and they've used up an entire 200 dose inhaler in a month. So you know that's a kid that's not well maintained. So you see how you kind of use this chart. So keep that in mind because they do ask, they like to ask questions like, they'll give you a scenario, well, Johnny has symptoms so many times during the day and he's had an awakening at night three to four times in a month and he has had to use his inhaler, you know, they go on like that and you have to identify where they might be because the next question is going to be how you're going to treat them. So this is, this is, you know, I know we've been talking a lot about not using medications, but this is one of the areas where meds are going to be important, and we know there's certain ones that are going to be key. So let's think about the 2007 guidelines that were updated. And again, I can't believe it's been five years. But what happened was the American College of Chest Physicians got together with other groups and said, you know what, asthma is out of control in our country. There's no reason for it. Part of it is overweightness and inactivity and other things too. But they wanted to focus on achieving and maintaining control, looking at some variability in asthma, severity conditions, looking to see how can we better monitor these kids. Because you know, asthma is not just you treating the patient. It's a family affair. The parent and the child have to work in partnership to manage it on a daily basis. It's just like when somebody has diabetes, I always tell them, it's your diabetes, not mine, when you come in without your blood sugars done, you know? So it's that same kind of situation. The asthma guidelines, they broke it down into three groups. You see in your notes there, you've got 0 to 4, 5 to 11, and greater than 12. Do you see that little note there where it's got them broken down? And um, they wanted you, us, to think about more comprehensive, frequent monitoring, and it says in your notes, in your manual, initially every two to four weeks until control is achieved, and if, if uncontrolled, you can escalate the treatment steps and follow up at least every two weeks. If they are controlled in three month period, you can step down. Now let me let you look at this next, this slide is like awesome, overwhelming, it's pretty, pretty involved. But let's think about this, I don't want you to get overwhelmed with this. This is the same chart. That's why I like the other chart so because it really sets the framework. But the, this chart, let's just look with me here for a minute. If you were going to take this all the way down to here, this whole box, see where my arrow is? That's the same chart I gave you earlier. Because you got intermittent, and I like how this is set up. This, actually, let me tell you this. You know, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has, if you go on their website, you're going to see for each one of those age groups, four charts, and that's like overwhelming. How do you put it together? So what, because we can't use those because it's copyrighted, we created our own to kind of look at how this, and so it looks pretty, pretty busy, but I don't want you to be overwhelmed with it. So when you think about, when you study this, I want you to go across, see we talked about the FEV1 right here, we talked about lung function, we talked about interference with normal activity and the rescue inhaler and nighttime daytime symptoms. Then it gets into risk. One of the things is, is risk assessment. How risky is their condition for them to get worse? And what they've done is they've said here for intermittent, zero to one year, exacerbations requiring oral systemic corticosteroids, consider severity. We don't want to put kids on oral steroids. We want to put them on what? Inhaled corticosteroids when it's appropriate. And then you can kind of look at these over here. I wouldn't spend a lot of time on the risk because they usually don't ask a lot of questions on the risk side. But where I want you to think about is how would you initiate therapy? And for the test, they suggest that we in primary care should only be managing two levels, intermittent and mild persistent. If you have a child that's moderate or severe, they need a pulmonologist. Does that make sense? So what do you think is the golden treatment for a child with what? That has intermittent. You're going to give them a Saba. What's a Saba? Short-acting beta agonist. And they should use it what? Two puffs every four to six hours as needed. But if they're in the intermittent level, it shouldn't be that often. Now, there are kids that do um, 
uh, practice like football, track, swimming, that because EIB, exercise induced bronchospasm, may need to use asaba before they do their treat, before they actually do their uh, practice. Does everybody remember how soon, how quickly sabas work? In five to 15 minutes, they will peak 30 to minutes to two hours and last four to six hours. That's pretty awesome for somebody that needs a little dose before they go doing their exercise, right? Now, what if you had a child that was considered mild persistent? That is where we prefer to start them on a what? Low dose inhaled corticosteroid. And let me tell you for the test. You know there's so many different steroids. They're not going to get into you picking a name. They just want you to know low dose inhaled corticosteroid. Does that make sense? Isn't that good for you? And then there is an alternate. Do you know they still use chromalin? Remember chromalin was given. Chromalin is used like four times a day at least, if not four to six times. That's still a, a, an option. And also Montelukas, which would be your singular, right? And the rest of it, you probably won't be asked a lot of questions in terms of management because the pulmonologist is supposed to manage them. So y'all okay with this? Now, you got them set up. You got the child a, a treatment plan. What they recommend according to closer monitoring is once you get them on a plan, say you got this child on, on low dose inhaled corticosteroid, stage step two, mild persistent. You want them to come back in two to three weeks. It says two to four weeks, two to four weeks. We'll stick with that, two to four weeks. And you do that for the entire three months that you started them on that treatment. If at the end of that treatment they've had absolutely no breakouts, guess what you can do? No extra exacerbations. They say you can drop them down, step down to taking them off the inhaled corticosteroid. Because we don't want kids on medicine unless they need it, right? If the next, because sometimes it's a matter of them just getting aware of themselves, where their symptoms are. So then the next three months, you check them again every two to four weeks. So again, these are frequent appointments, co-pays more often. That's where the cost is coming. And I know, I hate to say that, but parents need to know until you get into a good flow, they need to do this. Then you say the next three months they did pretty good, leave them alone. So you've done a six month run, you got them started, you stepped them down, and they're doing pretty stable. And then you teach them when they need to come back to you. Does that sound pretty good? Good. So excellent, you guys are doing good. Now let's talk about pneumonia. Pneumonia is, as you know, lower respiratory tract microorganism through aspiration, inhalation, um, through the bloodstream. We think about different etiologies such as your group B strep, chlamydia, E. coli, infants, RSV, strep pneumoniae, preschoolers, strep pneumoniae, mycoplasma, and chlamydia. And then you got your immunocompromised patients such as your PCP. Actually, this is no longer called PCP. Did you know that? I need to get that corrected in here. It's actually PJP. Do you know what it is? Geravici. Did you know it's an Italian germ now? <laughs> Not really. I'm just joking, y'all. Um, but it's actually, let's see if we got it correct. No, they didn't. So what I want you to know, it's actually pneumocystis. And in your material there where it says carini, they've renamed it. It's called Geravici. J, let me see if I get it right. Geravici, Geravici. Oh, my goodness. I think it's J-I-R-O-V-E-C-I. Geravici an Italian germ, Geravici. And you're thinking, why did they change the name? They just changed the name. But it's called PJP now. That's latest right off the boat in terms of knowledge with that. Okay. So um, 70 to 80 percent of all pneumonias, though, are viral. We know pretty much the signs and symptoms, chills, fever, lung consolidation, malaise. Your pulse oxes are going to go down, sputum. Infiltrates on x-ray, and when you think about the x-ray, we're going to take a look at a couple of x-rays. It's very important. Let's think about what would be on an x-ray, okay? Your H influenza strep and Klebsiella are going to be lobar consolidation. The whole lobe is going to be consolidated. You remember how when you look at a lung on x-ray, it looks kind of clear black? Both lungs are consolidated. There's, there's whitening. See all the white? And that's a good example of H influenza. Let's go back for a minute. Your PCP, diffuse interstitial 
alveolar infiltrates. Have you ever heard of ground glass? You've heard of, have you ever seen that or heard people say that? It looks like when you break a glass, it looks like little sprinkling, little infiltrate. They're kind of little sprinklings all inside here. And it's more clear. See, it's not low bar consolidated. It's really more clear with a little bit of sprinkling of infiltrate. And then here's E. coli. E. coli is um, an example here, which is looking at kind of some of the, um, uh, as it says here, patchy infiltrates and pleural effusion. It's on one side. Does that make sense? So those are some examples for you. There's staph, kind of a patchy um, infiltrate. And I don't know if we've gotten there, Pseudomonas. See how it looks kind of patchy? So um, now the way we're going to treat them, penicillin strep pneumonia is, be is best choice using your penicillin. Your macrolides, such as azithromycin or zithromax for M. cataralis. Some people refer to M. cataralis as the walking pneumonia organism. Amoxicillin cephalosporin H. influenza, that's a good choice. For your viral, your supportive um, treatment, antibiotics only if you're considering like a secondary bacterial infection, humidified O2 chest physiotherapy, and bronchodilators to help improve airway clearance. Cystic fibrosis. Now, you know you're not going to manage a child with cystic fibrosis. They're either going to go to a tertiary care facility. Like when I was at Emory, we had a whole tertiary care facility just for kids with cystic fibrosis or they'll be seen by a pulmonologist. But we need to think about what your role is in identifying these individuals. It's a chromosome 7 long arm mutation, um, recessive disorder, autosomal, chronic multi-system involvement, respiratory GI, hepatobiliary reproductive tracts. We know that we get progressive obstructive pulmonary disease, pancreatic insufficiency, and malabsorption. Caucasians. Life expectancy is actually greatly improving because they know so much more about antibiotics and which ones work best for these kids. But what I want you to think about is your role in the nursery. You're a new nurse practitioner making your rounds and you've got a newborn. You're looking for the passage of meconium. But if you have viscous meconium or a meconium ileus, it might be a red flag. Think about respiratory infections frequently or steatorrhea, which is the large liquid bulky foul stool salt tasting skin, chronic cough, um, enlarged liver and spleen, maybe some of your fat soluble um, in de uh, deficiencies, failure to thrive. These kids often, as they get a little older, they look like they've got ascites and emaciated extremities. The good old sweat test using polycarpine um, to try and get a certain level of sweat, 60 milli equivalents, is something that we're looking at as one of our uh, tools. If you did PFTs, obstructive pattern, and you think about hyponatremia, hyperchloremic dehydration, alkalosis would be very common because of the low levels of, um, of the transport of the, of the chloride. And on x-ray, you probably would pick up cystic lesions and atelectasis on these kids. These kids do need to be referred to specialty management, as we've mentioned. Okay, very good. All right.